So hello and welcome to our AI webinar, to our webinar on artificial intelligence. My name is Niklas Schmidt. I'm a partner at the Vienna office of Wolf Theis. As you might know, this is a three part webinar. The first part was one and a half months ago. I spoke on various AI tools that you should be using. So I spoke about chat GPT, mid journey, Dali two and other tools. This is uh, just one and a half months ago, but it seems like it was ages ago. Uh, so much has happened in the meantime. There's hardly a week where you do not have announcements of another 100 AI startups that have uh, uh, sort of uh, launched some new product. Then we had the second part. In the second part, we dealt with copyright issues of AI. We dealt with uh, liability issues of AI. We dealt with uh, issues that an HR department might have uh, when using AI tools. Today, I'm very happy to be able to present a great lineup of speakers. We're going to speak about deep fakes. Uh, so AI created fake uh, images and fake video. We're going to speak about data protection issues. We're going to speak about the EU's AI Act, so a new piece of legislation. And we're also going to speak about chatbot lawyers and about what experience uh, we ourselves have uh, testing out various chatbot lawyers. So we have a record number of registrations. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for your interest. I think this record number is due, not only, uh, it's not only due because of the topic, which is exciting, but also because of this great uh, lineup of speakers we have. Having said that, let me introduce the first speaker who is Flavius Floria. So Flavius is counsel in our Bucharest office in Romania. He heads the IP, the TMT, and the data protection practices there. He deals uh, with multinationals, so large group of companies, but also with startups and with everything in between. His uh, focus is uh, on privacy law, internet-related law, e-commerce, copyright, media, advertising, telecoms, Freedom of information, document retention, confidentiality. Uh, so uh, very, very interesting mix of topics. Uh, and uh, I think with that, I would hand over to you, Flavius, and look forward to your very uh, interesting presentation on deep fakes. Many thanks, many thanks, Niklas. Uh, many thanks for uh, for the initiative. Uh, it's it's a very good initiative. I'm really happy to be here. And I'm really happy to, to be talking about uh, deepfakes um, and specifically about the legal issues that the use of uh, deepfakes might entail. And um, I would like to touch upon specifically on a very interesting topic uh, from my point of view, namely uh, whether, uh, I'm anticipating a bit, but whether deepfakes should benefit of copyright protection or some sort of uh, similar degree or similar type of protection. Uh, with this being said, um, I would like to start with uh, the basic thing, I would say, let's see what are the fakes. Um, th there was a lot of buzz in, in the market about, uh, about the deep fakes. Uh, the fakes generally use AI to generate completely new video or audio or images um, with the end goal of portraying something that didn't actually happen in reality. So it's um, it's what the name says, it's a fake, but the term deep fake comes from the underlying technology. Um, behind the deep fake, there's, there's just always a deep learning algorithm uh, and this deep lear learning algorithm teaches themselves itself to solve problems with large sets of data. And this uh, type of algorithm can be used to create fake content of real people. Uh, I'm sure that all of you are aware of the um, fake AI generated image with the Pope Francis appearing to show Pope Francis walking outside the Vatican in a designer coat. Of course, he never did that. So <laughs> um, at, at first, I, I, I when I first saw this image, I, I was wondering what happened to the Pope, but it uh, very soon it came very clear to me that uh, it did not actually happen. Um, the deep fake is uh, footage generated by a computer that has been trained to 
countless existing images. So in this specific case of Pope Francis, the deep fake, the algorithm has been uh, trained with existing images of Pope Francis and the output is what we see here. But deep fakes aren't just any fake or misleading images. So this fake AI generated image of Pope Francis actually has a degree of human input in, uh, in it. Uh, what separates a deep fake from a generally uh, AI generated image is this element of human input. And this element of human input um, is a pre-existing condition for, for us to be talking about a, a deep fake. Um, if we, yeah. Um, it, one uh, important topic is the modality of using the deep fakes. How this deep fakes can be used. Um, the first and the, the most, uh, let's say, the, the, the most common, the most popular modality of using the deep fake has unfortunately been using them for illicit purposes, including to generate non-consensual pornography. And I was uh, I was reading uh, an article in the study uh, carried in 2019, which referred to to the use of deep fakes. And more than 90% of the deep fakes were used for this type of purpose for generating non-consensual pornography, non-consensual or consensual pornography. Uh, other than that, deepfake videos uh, have all have also been used in politics. And for example, in uh, 2018, we have a very, uh, very well known uh, example when a Belgian political party released a video of Donald Trump giving a speech calling Belgium uh, to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement. And of course, Trump never gave that speech. It was a, a deepfake. Um, however, there are also positive uses for uh, for this type of technology. So I I even if when we are thinking of deep fakes, maybe the negative use is the first thing that comes to our mind. Uh, there is there are also very positive examples. So, for example, the documentary of HBO "Welcome to Chechnya" used deep fake technology to hide the identities of Russian LGBTQ refugees who whose lives were at risk, while also telling the their stories. So, this uh, this is a very good example of a very positive use of, uh, of deep fake technology. Deep fake technology can also be used in medicine and in education. It can, it can be used to create learning tools and it can be also used as an accessibility feature within technology. Um, this technology could recreate persons in history. Uh, example of positive applications of deep fakes include bringing the deceased back to life. Uh, and also a, a very good example, and this is maybe a, a very important reason to, to keep this technology going and, uh, and to encourage this technolo technology being developed is, um, for example, the, generating the voice of people who actually lost their voice due to medical, uh, medical conditions. Uh, this, this, from my point of view, is a very good example of a really positive use. So basically, the AI, the deep fake technology can help people who lost their voice to regain their voice with the use of a computer and the, and the software or with the use of the phone on, and the software. Uh, deep fake technology could help save a lot of time and labor in the film industry, of course, but this will could bring us to an ethical problem that we will discuss. Um, deep fake technology could help educating people in a more interactive way, could help engaging with uh, viewers or customers in uh, more interactive ways. It could be really helpful. And I think that deep fake technology has also positive use cases. And there are a lot of positive use cases uh, which worth uh, which make our discussion worth it. So um, at the first glance, you would say that deep fakes are a negative thing. And uh, because they, they were they have a lot of risks and they have been used for defamation purposes, let's say they have been used for uh, illicit purposes as we will see in the next slide. But um, there are also a lot of positive uses and this, this positive uses um, 
are the main reason why we should encourage using this technology. Um, I was referring to the main risks entailed by the use of deep fakes. Of course, the most important risk is uh, the, the risk related to misinformation or disinformation. <clears throat> um, in this world well, where the technology can create a video, I don't know, in seconds or in minutes, um, it will be really hard to tell the fakes apart from the from the real videos, the, the fake footage uh, from the real footage. So this is the main risk then we should re be really careful about that. And uh, we should, um, and the, the legislators should most, and will most likely uh, introduce very uh, specific provisions related to this and obligations of the AI creators related to uh, preventing this type of content. And the most important thing will be the necessity to, to label the content and to, to make the public aware that the content is AI generated content and that it is a deep fake. Another problem would be the intellectual property infringement. This is the risk that has been identified specifically in the film industry in, um, and in, in, another, uh, in, in other areas. Um, another risk would be privacy infringement, but here we could say that uh, once the, the GDPR was enacted in 2018, data subjects have some remedies uh, and the risks related to defamation and pornography. Uh, there are also some uh, cybersecurity related risks and uh, <laughs> as hackers have, uh, have become more sophisticated and uh, they are tr they try to to use the deepfake technology in order to gain some financial uh, financial benefits. And for example, in 2019, hackers impersonated the phone request from a CEO, and this resulted in uh, in a bank transfer to to those hackers. And in 2021, we also have an example of <laughs> hackers tricking a bank manager into transferring 35 million dollars to a fraudulent bank account. So. Hackers can impersonate the voice of, uh, of uh, certain people, of uh, CEOs or, or top level executives, and this could trigger the, the employees to, uh, to transfer large amounts of money in uh, fraudulent bank, bank accounts. Uh, however, these incidents have forced institutions, financial institutions, to take measures against this type, uh, this type of attack. Okay. Um, the the spread of of use of deep fakes and the 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 spread of AI has also generated some discussion and there have been some wipe conversations on IP and AI. <clears throat> there are several issues identified during the conversation, and the main issue was whether the copyright system should take cognizance of deep fakes. Um. Specifically, the question, the first question would be whether copyright is an appropriate vehicle for the regulation of deepfakes. Uh, I would say that it could be. Copyright could be an appropriate vehicle and it could, uh, it could regulate and protect deepfakes. But of course, we have to uh, also have in mind the purposes. So we, we should somehow distinguish and the legislators should somehow distinguish between the illicit purposes of, uh, of uh, AI and of a deep fake being created for, and the moral, the the educational, the, the purposes chosen and um, chosen in good faith. And I think that copyright should protect um, AI uh, deep fakes uh, generated in good faith, but. Uh, and that it, the, the deep fake should benefit from uh, from copyright, of course, uh, but only in uh, in certain conditions, as mentioned before. Uh, another question would be to whom should the copyright in the deep fake belong? And I think that here uh, the, the solution is broader and should be regarded in a broader context. Namely, here we should have a. a um, a uniform solution for all the AI generated content. And we should we should look there and see to whom the copyright in the deep fake belong. And um, it would it will be at some point a solution similar to the 
solution, for example, under, under Romanian law, we have uh, the solution in relation to databases, the, the creator and the, the company that invested in a certain database is the owner of the rights over that database. So I think a similar solution uh, related to, to AI generated content would be beneficial. And the last question is whether the, if the deep fakes benefit from copyright, should there be a system of equitable remuneration for persons whose likenesses and performances are used in that deep fake? Uh, and I would say, yeah, of course it should be. We should have a system of uh, equitable remuneration. People, uh, people who have uh, consented for the use of their uh, of their content in uh, in a deep fake or for the for the purpose of generating a deep fake should certainly benefit from uh, some sort of payment um as uh, mentioned before, the main legal issue related to, to deep fakes is whether that deep fake imagery depicts a human subject in a manner or in a light which is inconsistent with the subject's uh, life uh, or work or status and which seems incongruent. And uh, th this, uh, if this happens, it seems incongruent that this deep fake should be rewarded with copyright protection. However, as I mentioned, there are instances where deepfake imagery may be deserving copyright protection. For example, in uh, arts, when you recreate an um, uh, uh, image or when you recreate a, a film with a deceased actor. In this case, yeah, the copyright in this resulting deepfake should be recognized and should be granted to the producer. However, this raises one ethical concern from my perspective. Um, I, I'm thinking whether this type of competition generated by the AI and by AI systems is fair towards the actors and towards the artists in general, because uh, AI and deepfakes can be related to any, any type of uh, image or video, and this can create an unfair competition. As you know, an AI system can generate the content of a video in a couple of minutes, in several minutes, and images are generated in seconds. And this, from my perspective, creates great uh, risks for human authors, which are taking uh, weeks, months, years to generate similar content. So um, here maybe we should have um, a discussion on the ethical concerns on this and on whether it is fair that an AI system competes with a human, uh, hum human creators. Um, <laughs> The victim of a deep fake, from my perspective, uh, should not own a copyright interest in their own image because they have other means of protection. The, the, the victim of the deep fake is protected and can take the uh, <clears throat> can benefit of the right of personal data protection, and uh, it can benefit from the provisions of the GDPR, of course. So if uh, the content, the co deep fake generated content uh, is not accurate based on article five of the GDPR, it should be deleted. And of course, the, um, the person, the victim has the right to erasure, if, even if the content seems accurate and seems to be consistent with the subject's life. Um, even in, in this case, the subject would have the right to erasure and would have the right to, to object to the processing. Thanks a lot. I, I hope that I've been able not to clarify, but at least to put on the table some of the some of the most important topics and legal issues related to the use of deep fakes. And uh, looking forward to for further discussions on this and looking forward to, to questions, to answering questions, of course. Thanks Super. a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Flavius. That was enlightening. And as you said, uh, a lot is in flux. So you, you, our goal is to basically show the questions that will have to be answered uh, over the next years by, by courts, for example, and by legislators. Um, uh, you mentioned that uh, you're happy if you get questions. What I forgot to mention actually at the beginning uh, is that if you have, if, uh, if you're in the audience and if you have any questions to our speakers, please put them into the chat. We will address all the questions in a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. We will still have a bit of time left so that uh, we will be able to 
uh, to tackle these. And uh, I apologize, last time we had a technical glitch. It was not possible uh, to put questions to the chat, but this will be, should be solved now. So please feel free to uh, use the chat function. So uh, uh, thanks again, Flavius. And let me now uh, introduce the next speaker, uh, who is Roland Marco. Roland is a partner in our firm's Vienna office. Roland specializes in data protection and uh, cybersecurity issues. He deals with IT outsourcing, with software, with cloud solutions. He has a lot of experience in the area of litigation. So he regularly does court proceedings, for example, uh, defense uh, against uh, GDPR fines. Uh, uh, and Roland is going to speak about data protection in the area of AI. And as you can see from his title, there's some peculiar example about a vacuum clean that he's going to address. So Roland, uh, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Nicholas, and good afternoon to you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to, to speak on, on specific data protection issues related to AI and to the use of uh, artificial intelligence services. Um, as you may well be aware of, um, there is a a rapid development and, and uh, growth of generative AI technologies. If you may have followed the first session of, of Nikki's um, uh, webinar series, you uh, will have uh, seen a uh, lot of, of use cases and services provided in this respect. Um, and they obviously come along with uh, quite some complex uh, privacy risks um, for individuals, for organizations, and for our society in, in, in its entirety, I would be tempted to say. Um, and um, not only from a data protection perspective, but also from a data security uh, perspective, there are most recent reports on, on leaks of sensitive information, on chat histories, also in relation to chat GPT. And you may have seen that OpenAI is the provider of ChatGPT um, has um, announced a bounty for um, all um, software developers that find um, um, flaws and, and glitches in, in, in the code so that they can, uh, via that um, bounty uh, provision, so to say, uh, further improve the, the security of the services. When talking about uh, data protection in, in this respect, um, of course, this is um, specific to an individual country or to an individual economic area um, with different um, um, levels of protection and requirements in this respect. But one can say that there are some basically globally accepted privacy principles, at least in the EU, in most um, uh, of the US states in the UK, there are principles like, for example, data quality, that uh, personal data has to be uh, accurate and correct, uh, um, uh, requirements and limitations to data collection. Um, collection collecting data must be um, based on a, on a, on a legitimate uh, legal basis um, in the overall purpose specification, which is uh, really quite a hurdle in this respect. The one uh, must only collect and process data for a specific purpose that is set already in advance and prior to, uh, to the actual data processing activity. There are limitations to the use of data, of course, for primary purpose, maybe for a secondary purpose. We will speak on that a little bit later. There are requirements on the security of the data as such. So information security, data security requirements, and um, special duties in relation to um, explaining in a transparent way what happens to the data when being processed. The accountability principle, um, meaning that uh, the data controller must be in a position to um, be able to explain what, what happens in the processing, what is the legal basis, and uh, it, he or she can be held accountable for an individual participation aiming on some sort of human interaction um, when it comes to decision-making processes. All these um, privacy principles um, apply 
to systems processing personal data. And this includes, of course, also training algorithms for generative AI and the use of generative AI as such. And now we take uh, a little bit uh, reference to the to the title uh, of this um, part of the of the webinar and the question: What you should be personally be aware of if uh, a robotic vacuum cleaner passes by? And um, the answer to that is is a little bit given by the by the picture that um, you can you can see on the on the on the right side of the of the slide. Um, it is. Uh, obviously a person in a quite uh, compromising situation. Background to that is uh, a photo taken by uh, a robot vacuum cleaner of, a, of called iRobots Roomba, um, which per se is not an AI device, but the idea behind was that um, it should be, it, its movements should have been uh, optimized First of all, by taking images and, and video footage in the homes of, of people where they are placed, based in. Um, obviously, the, the users consented uh, to, to let these vacuum cleaners into the homes for research purposes. This is so far we are we're all safe, also from a legal perspective, I guess. Then in the next step, and here uh, the AI component uh, comes into play, the footage was uploaded to Scale AI whose employees were, um, were instructed to label the audio clips, photos, and videos um, with specific tags. So they, they tag chairs or desks, um, boards, whatever comes uh, in the way of the vacuum cleaner in order to, to learn the AI behind yeah, and to improve the movements of the cleaner. Yeah. However, um, the photo statement did not only include just furniture, but also pics of, of people in, yeah, as you can see, quite intimate settings. And there will be posts. <laughs> uh, this again is, is, is quite is a human intervention, I have to say. It's not strictly related to the AI component um, as such, but um, it, it gives a good example of what may happen yeah, if automated processes um, take over to some extent. And, and there is also a quite prominent manufacturer of cars where uh, similar things happened with respect to pictures taken in the surrounding of, of, of these connected um, and, and automated uh, vehicles. Yeah. Um, so you see that uh, the data protection issues that uh, come along with the use and with the training of AI are quite imminent. And I only um, I picked out uh, three headlines, so to say, in this respect, to be to be tackled. The first issue is um, the one that, uh, related to the data collection and data processing. And as you will be aware of, uh, generative AI are using um, a large, mostly using uh, large uh, language models, which are trained on a mix of data sets. Um, also including data scraped from the internet. So this may be any sort of text or video footage, whatever um, is the basis of the, of the specific AI model. And these may, um, of course, uh, also include personal data. So uh, uh, information in relation to an individual human being, basically, as is the definition under the uh, EU General Data Protection Regulation. So whenever it comes to personal data being processed in a learning process or in the use of AI, this triggers the applicability in the uh, European Union of the GDPR. Yeah? It may also trigger the GDPR applicability, by the way, um, of data controllers at the outset of the European Union if it comes to the monitoring yeah, of um, EU citizens, uh, monitoring of their behavior. Um, we come to that a little bit later. So GDPR applicability means that I need an explicit legal basis for the collection, storage, and processing of data. And with respect to personal data scraped from the internet, from websites, um, I want to have to state that there is no general legal presumption that whatever is published on a website 
is so to say in the public domain and free to use. It is not with respect to copyright, nor is it with respect to data protection law. So there is no presumption of a legal basis in relation to personal data published. Yeah? Therefore, one has to uh, look at um, legal basis um, with which could provide for um, a sufficient legitimate um, grounds uh, for the processing of personal data. There are quite some, I have to say. This is, um, this is not um, something which is an absolute red flag. So there can be legal basis, of course. Yeah. Um, but you have to define it and, and uh, due to the accountability principle as a data controller, I have to explain why this is the most appropriate one. Um, first of all, there is uh, a specific legal basis for even sensitive data, could be uh, in relation to health, or could be in relation to religious confessions, political beliefs, philosophical um, uh, beliefs. Uh, that sensitive data, which is uh, manifestly published by the data subjects, so the one uh, that the data relates to, can be rightfully processed. Yeah? Um, this, however, really has to uh, be in a, in a setting where the data subject manifestly, so quite explicitly says, I am fine with uh, this sort of data in relation to myself being processed, being published. Yeah, in this case, also um, screen scraping from the internet uh, and secondary use in relation to AI models um, could be derived from this particular legal basis. With respect to any other non-sensitive, but even but still uh, personal data, there could be a legitimate interest in the processing, which. Um, if there are no um, secrecy deserving interests of the data subjects prevailing. Yeah? Um, this is at the end of, of the day uh, a balancing uh, of, of the interest in the data processing and of the secrecy um, interest of the data subject. And very um, specifically in the AI regulation, where the political consensus has already been. Um, uh, achieved, I think, today. Um, there is also uh, an entire article dealing with uh, personal data in relation to high-risk AI um, uh, systems. There are also some, some um, um, ideas with respect to sensitive data being used for training artificial intelligence services. Uh, so these, these uh, may be um, um, appropriate legal basis is for the collection and for the processing of personal data. Having checked that, um, uh, an AI service provider uh, must be um, well aware that data in relation to certain individuals, those ind individuals must be informed about how the data is collected and processed. Yeah? So the headline is transparency, transparency in relation to the data processing. The information must be provided uh, in an uh, easily accessible way and in sufficient detail in order to allow data subjects um, to use and exercise actually the data subjects' rights in relation to that, being the next point I'm going to speak about. So therefore, organizations using AI should be able to explain how a system, for example, makes automated decisions or half automated decisions uh, towards the end users and the data subjects, yeah, who may even not be well versed, and this is uh, this may give organizations quite a hard time explaining, so to say, how an AI algorithm works and what the output is. And if it comes to really fully automated decision making, yeah, uh, it is even uh, necessary to have the data subject consent there too. Um, and it was uh, already touched in, I think it was in the, in the, in the second part of this series, um, for example, in HR environment, um, such decisions are really not easy to implement, even though not uh, fully excluded. Then the third issue basically would be um, the data subjects rights. Um, every data subject, so the person, the 
natural person in relation to whom data is processed can exercise certain rights against the controller, for example, the rights to deletion, a right to be forgotten, yeah? um, and the right to rectification. And the data controller has to comply with these rights um, <clears throat> under the, uh, at least under certain, uh, if, if not certain exemptions um, provided by the law apply. Um, this may also give um, the data controller um, a hard time when it comes um, to a request for deletion of certain data. Um, deletion in a way that it cannot be restored anymore. And also deletion in a way that data will not be, once deleted in the next um, minute, be again scraped out of the internet and again rooted into the same training or artificial intelligence routine. Yeah? So all this has to be duly taken into account by, by the AI service provider and organizations um, availing themselves of AI services. The EU privacy regulators <clears throat> um, already have um, scrutinized um, AI services. Uh, just one example being Clearview AI, um, a company seated in the US, so they have no establishment within the European Union. Um, they are providing a face uh, a recognition service, um, which works in a way that you can upload a photo, and then the photo will obviously be matched against the database of, of uh, Clearview AI, um, and uh, the result will be the individual. The, the, the information on the individual that is most likely um, um, the one that corresponds to the photo uploaded. Yeah? Um, this uh, AI uh, algorithm was already scrutinized by the Italian, French, and, and British, uh, English um, um, privacy regulators, and they ordered uh, the provider to um, delete the pictures um, of the uh, respective complainants uh, because the algorithm allegedly lacked a legal basis to do so. I have to also say that um, people at UI argued that they are exempt and not um, within the scope of the GDPR um, because they are outside of the um, European Union um, established. Very topically and most up to date um, is, is um, the Italian supervisory authority who imposed a temporary ban on web service of chat GPT. Yeah. Um, it is only to be lifted if OpenAI implements certain measures by April 30, so um, until this weekend. Um, measures in respect to due information, to an uh, appropriate legal basis, to facilitating the exercise of data subjects' rights. The protection of children, so gates um, 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 age gating, and um, they also ordered to uh, raise an awareness campaign in, in relation to, to the service. Yeah? And it will be uh, very interesting to see how OpenAI, as the provider of ChatGPT, will deal with um, these um, uh, requirements. Uh, the German data protection authorities are jumping on the same train, and, and they, in addition to that, and even more interesting to me personally, I also uh, asked for the data protection impact assessment conducted by, by OpenAI. And the data protection impact assessment means that at the outside of um, data processing activity, one has to um, consider the impact on the data subjects. Yeah? If um, there is sensitive uh, data um, processed on a large scale, for example, which it may well be the case also in relation to that AI tool. And also on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, the US Federal Trade Commission is dealing with several um, developers and companies uh, using AI um, due to their um, scattered data protection legal um, framework. This is for the time being more or less uh, limited to the FTC Act, to aspects of credit reporting and equal credit opportunity, but also um, there have been some decisions already with respect to facial recognition software used by um, security organizations and the police in public spaces. 
Yeah. So summing up, it will be um, we are living in very exciting times uh, in terms of data protection and artificial uh, intelligence, and um, we are very stunned to see what the data protection uh, regulators will come along with in that respect. Super. Thank you very much, uh, Roland. And uh, with uh, that, we're going to head over now to the third presentation. Uh, Markus Eigner will be speaking about the EU's proposed AI Act. Let me quickly introduce Markus. So Markus is a senior associate here in Vienna at Wolf Tice, uh, Vienna office. He deals with uh, banking and finance matters, so domestic and cross-border financings. He is very interested in newer forms of, of uh, finance, uh, in particular blockchains. Uh, um, uh, Markus has just yesterday actually published an article on uh, the regulatory challenges of DeFi, of decentralized finance, which is a must read if you're interested in DeFi. And uh, Marcos is also very much interested in AI and is following this AI act professionally. So Marcos, let me hand over to you. Thanks, Nicholas, for the introduction. And let's uh, jump straight into it. Um, just as a quick update, um, as Marco, uh, as, as Roland just uh, mentioned before, um, the draft of the proposed AI Act has been um, passed by the EU Parliament yes, just yesterday and uh, is now entering in the tri in the, to the Trilog uh, negotiations. So now detailed uh, negotiations will take place. So what is the uh, EU Act about? It is about to establishing a EU-wide leveling playing field for artificial intelligence, especially for the development, marketing and use of AI systems. Um, and while uh, establishing and, and um, aiming for safety, especially from a legal perspective, uh, use of AI, it's also um, looking for some flexibility and fostering uh, further innovation, as this field will obviously um, will uh, further progress and, and uh, develop uh, in the upcoming years. Um, for that, the legislator has foreseen the possibility of the member states to implement regulatory sandboxes, um, meaning uh, to establish um, the possibility to apply uh, for a spot in such regulatory sandbox and during the time um, in the regulatory sandbox, um, a provider would just have to adhere to a lower standard of regulatory requirements. Um, getting fit and proper uh, to uh, fulfill our re uh, regulatory requirements while being in turn closely monitored by the competent authorities. The AI Act shall also um, implement uh, a system of monitoring and surveillance um, from the provider side, but also from a regulator side of AI systems. Um, it also prohibits uh, certain practices of AI systems. Um, we'll come to that uh, later. Um, and maybe uh, one of the most important things here is um, it also um, includes some, some interfaces with other uh, legislation um, and includes especially certain exemptions uh, for credit institutions to lower their administrative burden. Um, and for that, there is a, is, a, is a harmonization with the reporting, quality management, um, and risk assessment uh, regulations and processes of the CRD4. Also, there are certain exemptions for AI systems solely used um, for military purposes or uh, in accordance with uh, international treaties. So who are now the addressees of the AI Act? The main addressee um, is the provider, obviously, uh, and this can be any person, entity, um, uh, which is developing an AI system um, or that has an AI system developed for itself with a view to placing it on the market or putting it into service under its own name and trademark uh, within the EU, um, irrespective of whether such um, putting on the market is uh, free of charge or for consideration. Then there's also the importer, it's a natural legal entity um, established within the EU, um, putting on the market or placing into a service um, an AI system uh, of an entity outside, uh, established outside of the European Union. There's also the distributor. It's a natural personal legal entity within the supply chain, different from the provider or the importer. 
Also, uh, certain obligations are imposed on users when using an AI system, but only to the extent uh, an AI system is used for professional purposes. So private use is, is uh, private users are not subject to any obligations under the AI Act um, in principle. An operator can basically be everyone who uses or establishes an AI system. And also uh, certain obligations are foreseen for manufacturers uh, who place on the market a product uh, together with an AI system. So um, what are now the prohibited practices? The EU Act um, foresees, uh, includes a list of, of certain practices which are per se uh, prohibited for AI use, uh, namely AI systems using subliminal techniques beyond a person's consciousness to materially distort its behavior in a way likely to cause physical or psychological damage to itself or any other person. Uh, exploitation of vulnerabilities of persons due to their age, physical or mental disabilities. Also social scoring uh, is prohibited uh, by or on behalf of public authorities. So also any third parties and private entities uh, acting on behalf of public authorities are not allowed to do social scoring. And also uh, real-time remote biometric identification systems in publicly accessible places uh, for law enforcement are forbidden except for the targeted search of potential uh, crime victims, specific prevention of threats of life or physical safety, or localization, detection, identification, uh, or prosecution of perpetrators or suspects uh, of certain uh, uh, crime offenses, such as terrorism, murder, or child pornography. So what does now lead uh, uh, to uh, an AI system as being uh, to being classified as a high-risk AI system? There are two alternatives under the proposed AI Act. Either the AI system is intended to be used as a safety component of a product or is itself a product covered by a specific uh, EU harmonization legislation listed in an annex uh, of the AI Act and such product um, is required to undergo a third party conformity assessment uh, under such uh, legislation. This is mainly uh, referring to already existing uh, product uh, related uh, harmonization legislation, which, is, uh, which aims for, uh, pro, uh, for mitigating risks to fundamental rights, uh, safety and uh, life of, of natural persons. Uh, such as legislation in relation to medical devices, machinery, also oil and gas is covered. And the second alternative uh, for a classification as a high-risk AI system is if the AI system operates in certain categories listed in an Annex 3 of the AI Act, including inter alia um, assistance of uh, judicial processes, law enforcement, or biometric identification and categorization of natural persons. Then there's also a uh, regulation uh, proposed for general purpose AI systems. This is not uh, included in the publicly available draft of the AI Act uh, at the moment, but has been widely agreed on uh, by the stakeholders. So what is a general purpose AI system? This is a tool including uh, open source software intended by the provider to perform generally applicable functions such as image and speech recognition, audio and video generation, pattern detection, question answering, translation, and similar functions. And this is obviously uh, driven by the a recent hype around ChatGPT, Midjourney, Dolly, and, and similar tools. A general purpose AI will, will in general be uh, subject to the same uh, uh, obligations and requirements as high-risk AI systems. And therefore, whenever I'm referring to a high-risk AI system, it also encompasses the general purpose AI systems. So what are other requirements for high-risk AI systems? Um, a high-risk AI system, a provider of a high-risk AI system needs to establish um, a sufficient and adequate risk management system uh, for the use of the AI system. Um, and it shall be, you know, uh, shall be uh, capable of identifying any potential risks in course of the intended use of the AI system. Also, um, data and data governance is the main point. Uh, Roland uh, just had a few words about that. So I'm just uh, mentioning here a few, a, a few things which are also relevant here, mainly that uh, 
the quality and quantity of the data that's been fed into the database is uh, is sufficient and also uh, accurate. Um, this point mainly refers uh, to the to the uh, to the learning of the AI system, um, and also what needs to be ensured is that the AI system is not uh, subject to any biases. Technical documentation also has to be drawn up by the provider in order for the competent authorities uh, to comprehensively be in a possession to a position to assess uh, the technical uh, background and, and specifics of the AI system and to review whether a system is in compliance with the AI Act. Record keeping uh, is a big point. Um, if possible, every use of the AI system should be traceable and also be recorded. Um, transparency and information for users is a big thing. It's, uh, guidance for the users, how to use the AI system and what is the intended uh, purpose of the AI system. Human oversight also needs to be uh, ensured, meaning uh, that the AI system needs to either already technically implement um, an option for humans to uh, supervise uh, the use of the AI system or um, the documentary which uh, comes along with the AI system needs to lay down certain options and, and possibilities uh, for humans to effectively uh, oversee the AI system. And this uh, will, will include options like a kill switch um, and should put um, humans in a position to uh, more or less easily identify any potential risks uh, to fundamental rights, safety, uh, and life of, of any other persons. Then also the data that's been fed into the system needs to be accurate. Um, and also the system, uh, meaning any hardware behind it or um, the software itself needs to be robust, meaning uh, it should be a capable of maintaining its service and stability throughout the intended life cycle. Yes, um, and cybersecurity, I think, is a self-explanatory point. Obviously, the data needs to be uh, secure and should not be uh, easily accessible by any uh, hackers. Also, post-market uh, monitoring needs to be um, established by the provider, uh, meaning that uh, throughout the uh, operation of the system and uh, providing it on the market, uh, the provider needs to ensure that uh, compliance is always, uh, that the AI system is always in compliance with the AI Act. So what are now the obligations? Obviously the provider is the, is the main point, uh, the main, main person uh, in the AI Act um, and uh, compliance with the requirements mentioned before is, uh, one of the main obligations. Also, um, um, and the provider needs to always monitor the, uh, the use of the AI systems and its operations and implement any corrective measures in case of non-compliance with the EU AI Act and notify the competent authorities of such non-compliance and corrective measures implemented. Also, a quality management needs to be established, uh, which shall always be in a position uh, to ensure compliance with the regulation. And this needs to be laid down by written policies, procedures, and instructions. A main pillar of the AI Act will be the conformity assessment. We'll come to that later in more detail. Storage of automatically uh, generated logs is also an obligation of providers, but only to such, a, such extent that the um, provider has access to such data. Uh, due to uh, applicable law or a co contract. And the final obligation um, is also is a registration with uh, the uh, envisaged EU-wide database for AI systems. Um, we'll also have a short look on that uh, at the end of the presentation. So as mentioned previously, certain manufacturers uh, will also have obligations, namely the same obligations as a provider in case uh, they put on the market uh, a product together with an AI, with a high-risk AI system. Um, this will most likely be, uh, main addresses here will be uh, computer producers. Then there are also the importers. Um, these must check uh, whether the conformity assessment has been done uh, by the provider. The technically, the, uh, technical documentation has been drawn up in line with the UI Act. Um, 
a conformity marking has been affixed to the AI system and the AI system uh, has sufficient instructions of use. Distributors uh, must verify conf the conformity marking uh, along with the instructions of use, uh, uh, and also have to have to check whether the provider or the importer has complied with the requirements of the EU regula uh, regulation. Then an obligation for any person, so also private persons, is that they will be regarded as a provider under the EU uh, AI Act in case uh, they place on the market or put into service a high-risk AI system modify the intended use uh, of as an established high-risk AI system or make a substantial uh, modification to an existing high-risk AI system. And in general, users, always keeping in mind that uh, just the professional use is, is regulated, uh, shall monitor the use of the high-risk AI system and use the system in line with the instructions of use and the intended purpose. Also, they are obliged to inform uh, the provider or distributor in case uh, they identify any risk of health, safety, or fundamental rights of a person. There's also a, a general obligation for providers of all AI for purpose AI systems. Um, such AI, uh, such uh, AI systems need to inform the user. Uh, in, in prior to the use in case uh, the AI systems uh, interact with uh, natural persons, unless it is obvious of, from the use that it's not uh, a real person behind uh, the interaction, use of emotional recognition or biometric categorization, or, and this will be one of the main uh, points, if an AI system generates or manipulates images, audio or video content, and such content can be confused uh, as being authentic or truthful being deepfakes. In case uh, there's no EU-based uh, importer or provider, uh, the non-EU-based provider needs to appoint an EU-based uh, authorized representative who will be um, responsible for compliance with the EU AI Act. And therefore, um, the EU um, obliges uh, providers to always have a, a person within the EU that uh, that is uh, that ensures the compliance with the AI Act. So now to the uh, to one of the main pillars, uh, the conformity assessment. Uh, just shortly to the competent authorities, um, every state has to uh, nominate uh, a designated entity being a governmental or uh, authority uh, which can license certain conformity assessment bodies. These can be private entities uh, to conduct uh, a conformity assessment. Um, and to the procedure itself, the AI Act uh, foresees uh, different levels um, of uh, conformity assessment. So there are three options, uh, either a self-assessment, being an internal control-based uh, assessment, uh, involvement, of, involvement of notified bodies being the conformity assessment bodies or the conformity assessment is uh, being conducted in compliance uh, with, con with a conformity assessment foreseen by uh, another EU legislation. In principle, uh, for the conformity assessment, uh, the AI Act also foresees two options where conformity is presumed by law, uh, namely in case there is a harmonized EU standard and the system is in compliance with such standards, or the EU uh, at some point publishes a common specifications for certain types of high-risk AI systems. So if conformity assessment is uh, being conducted uh, by involving a conformity assessment body, such conformity assessment body uh, needs to uh, issue a certificate confirming compliance. This can be valid of up, uh, for a period of up to five years and can be extended based on a reassessment. Also, um, a EU declaration of conformity needs to be drawn up by the provider, uh, which needs to in include a certain uh, information laid down by the regulation. Uh, and this is more or less an internal document um, which needs to be shown to the competent authorities upon, upon request. 
the more visible uh, sigil and the important thing here for the, for the public is the CE marking of conformity. And this is uh, basically uh, a symbol uh, being affixed to the AI system, which will in most cases not work. So it will be affixed to a, a packaging or documentation coming along with the system, uh, stating that the system is in conformance with the UAI Act. Then just shortly, um, a brief overview. As I mentioned, the EU is planning to introduce um, a EU-wide database for high-risk AI systems and general purpose AI systems, uh, where the provider needs to register certain information. So if you're interested, here is the information required. Um, and then last but not least, the penalties, which are quite substantial. Um, the system is more or less oriented on the GDPR regime and fines can be uh, charged on providers and, and other regulated uh, entities uh, of the higher of uh, up to 30 million. Or 6% of the end practice uh, AI systems are used for a prohibited practice or the data and data governance uh, obligations are not fulfilled fines up to 20 million or 4% of the worldwide ten annual turnover for any other breach of obligations and fines of up to 10 million and 2% for any uh, uh, supply of incorrect, incomplete or misleading information. Thanks for listening and I hope uh, this uh, gave you a good and comprehensive overview over the proposed AI regime. Super, thank you very much, uh, Markus, for going through this uh, voluminous uh, document in, in a short uh, span of time. Uh, we will uh, now move over to Angelica. Angelica Zotter, whom I'm going to introduce now. So Angelica <clears throat> sorry, is an associate in the Vienna office of Wolf Ties uh, in two teams, in two practice groups. On the one hand, dispute resolution, and on the other hand, IP and TMT. Uh, Angelica does a lot of work in the areas of litigation, compliance, criminal law. She has been working for lots of interesting organizations like the Ministry of the Interior, of the Republic of Austria, the Public Prosecutor's Office. She has been at uh, a United Nations organization uh, and uh, also at university. She has a PhD in law. And Angelica will uh, speak today about her experiences trying out one of our competitors, so to say. So if you listened up to this point, uh, many of these AI applications are going to generate a lot of legal issues, a lot of controversy, a lot of weighing of rights against each other, and, and consequently, uh, there will be uh, lots and lots of lawsuits and regulatory action and, and what so on, and whatsoever, uh, uh, that will generate more work, but maybe we'll also have less work as lawyers uh, with these, uh, this new era of chatbot lawyers. So Angelica, uh, let me hand over to you. Thank you, Niklas. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for joining me today to discuss my personal experience with using one of the new chatbot lawyers. So in the next 20 minutes, we will discuss uh, the definition, what is a chatbot lawyer and what can I use it for? Then my personal experience of actually trying out a chatbot, a chatbot lawyer. And then third, the conclusion, what did I find out? First of all, the definition, what is a chatbot lawyer? It's uh, two words, chatbot and lawyer. What is a chatbot? Everybody knows it. It's a computer program designed to simulate a conversation with human users. So a chatbot writes you back in an automated manner, and it actually feels like you're talking or writing with another human person. And the chatbot lawyer or legal chatbot is a very specialized chatbot. It's a computer program also with a chat environment designed to provide legal advice and guidance through this online chat interface. And how does it work? A legal chatbot uses artificial intelligence and natural language processing to understand and interpret questions posed by the users. And then it generates responses based on the available information and databases, and uh, also based on uh, relevant legal information it can find. So in the recent past, especially, uh, chatbot lawyers have gained popularity especially in the, in the fields of contract review, document drafting, legal research, and even dispute resolution. 
the robot lawyers are here and they're winning. And what is this about? This was a headline in November 2017 already, so a couple of years ago. And this article was about a contest between 100 uh, lawyers from London law firms and an AI program called Case Cruncher Alpha. So what happened in this contest? Uh, both the AI and the lawyers were given the facts, the basic facts of hundreds of uh, small payment protection insurance cases. And the task was to predict how, uh, how would the financial ombudsman react? Would he allow a claim based on the facts available or not? And who won? Well, that's the result. In all, there were 775 predictions and the case cruncher had an accuracy rate of 86.6% compared to only and still, but only 66.3% uh, from the lawyers. So what we see here is that AI legal chatbots could be used in this area of assessing success chances of a certain case, at least on, on a uh, small basic level. Another headline was the following. This happened, uh, this was very recent, so January 2023. And uh, the headline was a robot lawyer to argue in court in first, uh, for the first time. So what happened here? The company do not pay. They had the intention to send their robot lawyer to court to help a defendant uh, fight a parking ticket. So also quite a simple case. But uh, the idea was that the defendant would have his smartphone with him and this robot lawyer would run on the smartphone, then listen to the court argument or to, to the arguments that were spoken at court and uh, generate responses. And these responses, uh, the, the defendant would have headphones and the lawyer should whisper into the defendant's ear and uh, tell him what to say, uh, when to respond, what to respond uh, at a given time. That was the intention. But unfortunately, it didn't happen because the CEO, the company CEO received warnings from uh, lawyers, from state prosecutors that said, well, uh, you can do that or you shouldn't do that because as you know, it's prohibited to practice law without a license. And so, uh, this was the tweet by the CEO, good morning, bad news, after receiving threats from state bar prosecutors, it seems likely that they will put me in jail for six months if I follow through. So unfortunately, this project was postponed at least, maybe canceled altogether. But uh, yeah, it would have been very interesting to actually see how this turns out, a robot lawyer use case at court. But anyways, there are many other legal chatbots available right now. These are just a few examples of everything that's available out there. And uh, they, uh, the relevance depends on, on user-specific needs. So do not pay, we just mentioned it, uh, the world's first robot lawyer. Do not pay covers a wide range of legal issues. So not just parking tickets, but in general, small court claims, or even uh, it provides assistance with how to fill in certain documents for, for government purposes. And uh, yeah, so, so a big range of topics. However, it's designed to serve in the US, in the UK and Canada. So these jurisdictions only. Then we have uh, a Lira or AI Lira, which is something similar, but in Australia. We have a robot lawyer Lisa on the other side, uh, uh, which is uh, focused on, on designing NDAs within a very short amount of time. We have a Spellbook, which is a program to help you draft contracts. Billy Bot also is specialized on contract review. And then we have uh, Ross, AI lawyer Ross, who was actually hired even a couple of years ago by a law firm to help with uh, document research. So when you, you imagine a big complex uh, white collar craze with tons of documents, that robot was hired to help the associates and the lawyers uh, find relevant information. Uh, so, of course, as a, as a person who's very interested in the law and in technology, I was intrigued by the idea of trying out one of these chatbot lawyers. But as I found out, my first experience was that it's not that easy. So I wanted to try out this one, 
sounds quite simple. Also, it gives you a great promise. A spellbook draft contracts three times faster with AI. And I thought, wow, amazing. Uh, let's sign up for that. And this is the answer I received. You're on the wait list. Your current position is 20, uh, 28,000 something. So I still haven't received uh, my permission to use it. This was a couple of weeks ago. As you can imagine, it takes some time for the uh, for the chatbots to to be ready uh, for use. There are many people who are interested in this, hence the big waiting list. So after some research, I decided to try out this one. Uh, do not pay. I mentioned already it's limited to the U.S. Uh, um, um, UK legal systems, but uh, anyways, you can always try out how it works. And uh, also it's relevant in case you have some issue in the US like uh, business operations or you're on vacation, something happens. So I thought, let's see what it does. And as you can see on the interface already, it's very, uh, just a previous slide please, Niklas, uh, thank you. Uh, here you can see it covers a wide range of topics. So it really goes from uh, fighting parking tickets to customer services, bank fees, or I'm owed a certain amount of money uh, and wage protection. These are just very few examples of what you would already, uh, of what you can actually experience. And how does it work? First, you have this uh, sign up login uh, button here. Uh, for, to sign up, you need to connect your credit card. So it's not for free. You have to pay $36 for a period of two months and then you can renew. But anyways, you need to connect your credit card and then uh, you can start. Uh, the, you get to this page where the lawyer asks you what can I help you with. And uh, from out of all the options, uh, I chose something simple. Thank you. Uh, um, here, for example, customer service issues, ticket disputes, uh, hidden money, whatever, <laughs> whatever that is. And uh, I'm owed a certain amount of money. So you click on this button. I'm owed uh, 500 or over 500 dollars. Then the system tells you. I can generate demand letters, court filings, and also give you a script to read in court. So it's really a very comprehensive offer that you can get. Uh, but like we would ask clients, also this chatbot lawyer asks you before we begin, please start the information. So tell me what happened. Then we can write the demand letter. And uh, it already tells you what it will need in, in the near future. You need to type in the name and address of the individual you're suing, which is, of course, uh, which uh, was a bit of a challenge considering that I didn't actually want to sue anybody. <laughs> so I had to come up with, uh, with an address. A tricky part, it also checks the address. So it has to be a real one. I chose uh, the address of, of some museum in New York City. And the person I said I wanted to sue was Peter Parker. So Peter Parker owes me money. And uh, I would like to have a demand letter for that problem. Then uh, what did the system tell me uh, as, a next, it, uh, as a next step? I didn't have to write anything, but it gave me very clear short questions like which of these reasons most closely describes your reason for a lawsuit? And then you have a few options. You have breach of contract, a broken promise, a personal injury. So all you have to do is choose what's most relevant. And I, I just randomly chose a breach of contract. Peter Parker and I, we had a contract and uh, he owes me money. So the system said, I can help with that. Are you attempting to recover funds from a business or an individual? So uh, individual, this is where I had to, to actually type in name and address. Then it keeps going. It says, oh, when did the incident happen or when did you last contact them? And you see a calendar like we know it from from an email system it's a calendar you just have to click on a certain date and choose a year and there you go so then the next uh, the next information i received was okay great the next step uh, is to the first step is to send a legally sound demand letter to peter parker and if that doesn't work i will help you take them to court so it, it's it's talking to you like like a real lawyer and guiding you through the process uh, in in very clear steps and then it even gives you the option draft the demand letter and send it to me so I can receive it in my email account or it even offers to send the demand letter for you so you can choose whatever option you you prefer 
I chose uh, naturally, please send it to me. And within minutes, I received a very, very professional uh, demand letter, very basic, but it had all the necessary uh, information. It was easy, very clear to understand. It had a clear structure, a nice format. And again, all of this within, I think, 10 to 15 minutes of my time and for not so much money. So my impression was that if, if you are uh, in need of uh, quick uh, advice, or if you have a small issue, uh, a, a simple legal question to answer, then this might be a very efficient way uh, to save time, effort, and, and money, naturally. This is not the only, uh, um, the only area that uh, Do Not Pay offers. As you can see here, they offer services in, in the area of product and car recalls. And told car services, uh, if, if your car, if you park in the wrong spot <laughs> and your car disappears, then uh, you can get some help uh, in that regard too. Senior living assistance or recover passports. So the topics are really topics that could affect you or a person you know in your everyday life. Also here, very relevant, I felt was uh, assistance with government paperwork. For example, I mean, become a whistleblower, okay, but uh, birth certificates, death certificates, how to proceed with that, how to fill them in, it, uh, it guides you through the process in, uh, with a clear design, colorful design, and in a manner that's very easy to understand and very straightforward. Then also we have here another area, which is business products. If you have a small or medium-sized business in the US, then this uh, lawyer can help you with trademark registration, uh, but also how to remove uh, negative business reviews and uh, even website compliance. So if you if you have your you just started your business, you created your your website, then uh, do not pay offers to check this website, and it it writes you a report uh, pointing out what you what's missing for the website to comply with all the legal requirements like uh, in the area of, of uh, data privacy, for example. And it uh, gives you concrete suggestions on how to improve your website for, for the website to be compliant with the relevant legal provisions. So uh, really an, an, impressive, an impressive range of products and services that you can find here. So in general, what did I find out? What, what was my take from this? Chatbots or legal chatbots can be a very valuable assistance for simple legal issues like uh, consumer rights, parking tickets, uh, filling out uh, documents for whatever reason. However, uh, there are some limitations. So first of all, I already mentioned this, jurisdictions. You have many chatbots nowadays or legal chatbots that are designed for limited or for certain jurisdictions only like uh, Anglo-American uh, or just Australia, for example. So um, right now, at, or at least uh, not to my awareness, there's nothing similar, nothing comparable within the EU, uh, let alone Austria. And uh, right now, these chatbot lawyers, they can help you if you have some issue in the US, if you have operations in the US. Other than that, it's not really relevant for EU citizens or Austrian users right now. Another limitation, naturally, it's uh, quite general. So if you have a, a case that might be dependent on specific facts, do not pay might not have the answer for that. But if you have a simple uh, case, then it can give you a very, a, a very good uh, general answer that might apply to your case. Uh, specifics or, or more complex cases uh, might be overwhelming for these systems right now, in, in my experience. A, a big, uh, a more complex case where the law might not be clear, I believe could not be handled right now at this point. But in general, and, and this is, I believe, very clear to see, the AI tools available nowadays are transformative without any doubt and disruptive, and they will change our ways of working a lot within the next years. I'm very sure of that. They just need to be correctly applied and efficiently applied. But then if we manage to integrate them in our everyday life and work, then they can be very important additional brains uh, for lawyers, for companies, 
but also very important working tools and not just the chatbot lawyers, but also the tools available like chat uh, GPT, for example. And I'm very excited to see what's going to come next in, in the near future and where this will lead to. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to your questions. Super. Thank you very much, Angelica, for leading us through this uh, really interesting area of chatbots and chatbot lawyers. So we are now going to take a look at our chat, at the chat box, and uh, see what questions have uh, uh, sort of been, been put forward. If you have anything on your mind, feel free to put it into the, uh, into the chat. So let me start off. Uh, I'm going to try to sort of order the questions a bit. Let me uh, try to start off with a question to, uh, to Roland. Uh, Roland, you came from the uh, area of the, uh, from the point of view of the GDPR, and you mentioned the explainability uh, of uh, uh, decision making by a system. Now, uh, uh, Angelika Hofer uh, uh, asked the question uh, how does this work uh, since open AI representatives have recently said that um, it is actually impossible uh, to explain how the system comes to decisions. So it's basically what is called the black box. And uh, 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 Angelika Hofer's question here is, how does that fit together uh, with uh, the requirements that you had on your slide? Yeah, uh, perfect, perfect question, I have to say. <laughs> um, st starting, uh, starting point is that we are already now uh, putting uh, AI services completely aside, have quite some um, challenges uh, <clears throat> in explaining certain, let's say, uh, how a certain um, algorithm of a search engine, for example, functions, yeah, in a way that the average data subject, yeah, which is the, the affected person, yeah, um, is put in a, in a position to comprehend what, what happens, yeah, and this, of course, um, is even uh, further um, burdensome when it when it comes to AI and the elements uh, that uh, an AI system by its very nature yeah, um, is all about. Um, and if a representative says that it's uh, it's, it's it's a black box, actually, um, I would frame it a little bit different from an from a perspective of a service provider, because um, if it's um, I would I would revert to to trade secrets, actually, yeah, that I cannot be forced to um, the, to disclose yeah, uh, in an explanation of an AI system in, in very much detail. So I would I would rather strive for uh, the bigger picture in explaining that if A uh, is fed into a specific system, then B comes out and what happens in between is um, sort of a process um, that's depending on the individual AI system, um, I would I would set out in in quite some ge general wordings, and I think this uh, this is uh, what what one could could do at this point in, in time. Yeah. Well, I, I guess uh, um, technology is always very fast. Uh, it's disruptive. It just shows up. Does not ask uh, the legislator to act before it shows up, and and uh, uh, the legislator will just will just might have to adapt and yeah. and to make changes. Okay, thank you. Uh, then, then a question, uh, then maybe uh, just for everybody to know, you will get an email with a link to the recording and with a link to the slides. The email will be sent out on Wednesday. Uh, so uh, uh, if you have a bit of patience, you will get uh, the materials uh, on Wednesday. Uh, then a question to Angelica, uh, which has been posed by Alice Fremold. Uh, uh, Alice is asking, um, um, well, uh, how about sort of uh, uh, cases where you have to make predictions? Uh, can you can you maybe uh, say a few words on on that, Angelica? Um, uh, sort of you have you have mentioned anyway one example uh, where prediction were sort of the, the 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 output and where humans were being compared with with this uh, bot. Yeah, I think uh, this, of course, would be amazing. I think this uh, tool to, to predict the outcome of a case would be very useful for everything uh, that, that we are working with, whether it's a simple or a complex case. In the end, you always have to, to give a prediction. And if AI can help you with that, then even better. Right now, my impression is, however, that, uh, that AI is overwhelmed with uh, complex facts. So this is something that we that could happen in the future, 
But in this uh, test contest, for example, it was also very basic facts of small cases. So nothing too complicated. And I think uh, that, uh, that this is where we are right now, that with simple cases, uh, it's very accurate, as we can see, and, and not entirely accurate. So it was 86%, but uh, quite accurate. And of course, the more complex it gets, it, it gets uh, the more difficult and the less accurate it becomes. So my impression is that we're not fully there yet, but hopefully in the future, because of course this would be very valuable. Uh, what I do think, however, in uh, when it comes to complex cases, whenever you have a huge amount of documents, then uh, the, the risk of making a mistake or overlooking something crucial is of course quite high. And if you have an AI uh, robot or a robot lawyer, like, like this Ross, a uh, lawyer, for example, somebody who can screen uh, tons of documents within a very short amount of time and look for critical words or, or uh, conclusions. I think this, uh, this would be maybe a bit more helpful in this context when it comes to big cases with lots of documents. Yeah, super. I think maybe uh, we can make an analogy to, to the field of, of medicine. So a medical doctor will only have a certain uh, level of experience. You will only have seen a certain number of, I don't know, tumor cases, cancer cells. Uh, but a system that has basically seen all uh, reports, all x-rays or whatever, uh, MRI uh, scans and so on, uh, that have at any point in time in the last uh, 20 years been produced, such a system, of course, has a lot more experience and might make better predictions. And similarly, if you're a lawyer practicing in the US, you're a solo practitioner, uh, you had, I don't know, in the last 25 years, you had a certain number of cases and you have access to certain databases, but you have not read everything. Uh, it's a very different situation if you have read everything as, as such a bot lawyer might have done, and then you might be better, you might have a better gut feeling predicting uh, the outcome of a certain concrete case. Okay, let me uh, take a look at what other questions we have. Uh, and, and Gernot is asking something that we can combine. It's a question actually to, to Roland. Uh, so uh, the question is about uh, concretely chat GPT. Uh, basically what you feed in becomes part of the domain of the knowledge of the system. And uh, maybe Roland, can you comment on this new feature that OpenAI has just, I think it was last week or so, uh, presented where you can basically say that certain questions you ask uh, uh, will will not sort of be incorporated into this corpus of of knowledge. Yeah? Maybe if you could could say a few words on on on, on this aspect for for Gernot. Yeah, uh, obviously um, uh, this this function uh, also um, was um, introduced with with a view maybe to to data protection aspects. Um, um, you are right. Basically, every question you ask becomes uh, um, part of the domain of of, of OpenAI. Um, and if this entails also personal um, uh, personal information, um, this um, the entire um, set of rules of the GDPR uh, will will apply in this respect. And uh, first question is: Who is the data controller? Is it AI only, or is it also maybe in joint controllership the user of AI feeding in the data um, in relation to specific persons? And yeah. Um, if um, if there is a certain uh, degree of uncertainty uh, in relation to the legal basis for the use of personal information, um, uh, the, this, this, this function may help to limit down the data feed to what is um, uh, is, is more compliant, so to say, yeah, to bring it that way. Yeah, um, I think uh, uh, that's it. Uh, there's uh, a last question I see here. Uh, uh, Gerard is asking about uh, basically the possibility to use AI tools locally on your computer. I mean, there are some things that you can run locally uh, um, uh, if you have the right equipment, actually. Uh, but maybe, maybe anyway, with this uh, new chat GPT feature, uh, that, that would be possibility. I mean, this, for example, I just saw uh, a few days ago uh, an application called a chat PDF where you can upload a whole PDF uh, to, to, to analyze uh, the content. But uh, I think here, again, the issue is about confidentiality. You don't really want to upload something to a system uh, where, where this information could be used. And there were some nice 
uh, not nice, some, some bad cases uh, uh, that you could read on, uh, on, on social media about this. Okay, super. I think uh, we are through. So um, uh, again, thank you very much uh, for joining. Uh, thank you for sort of um, uh, doing this three-part journey with us. Uh, if you missed the other two parts, you can still uh, find them on our YouTube channel. Uh, this concludes the three-part series. We might be doing a final Mohiri uh, part. Uh, I'm just thinking about uh, what we're going to do in this. It might have to do with topics such as AI alignment, value drift, uh, AI becoming sentient, uh, all sorts of horror stories, uh, movies uh, that, that you might have uh, uh, seen in the past uh, coming through. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll see uh, that that might be something for, for autumn uh, when, we, uh, when, when we see what, uh, what, what has happened over summertime. So thank you again for joining and uh, uh, have a nice uh, rest of the day.